I want to start with a question to every listener out there. If you were asked, where did Christ atone for our sins? What would you say? Where would you say that the atonement mostly took place? My colleague John Hilton III has interviewed a few hundred people asking them that question. And listen to what he says. So I've surveyed several hundred people, most of them students at Brigham Young University, although some from other populations. And when asked, where did Christ atone for our sins? More than 60% will write Gethsemane only. He asked another version of the question to almost a thousand people and listen to this explanation. Where would you say the atonement mostly took place? And students had to select between Calvary and Gethsemane. And 88% of students said in the Garden of Gethsemane, and 12% said on the cross. Today on Why Religion, we are going to look at a study by John Hilton III, where he explores the scriptural emphasis of the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, and why our typical church answers about the Savior's atonement sometimes don't align with our own scriptural teachings about the atonement, and why they should. I'm your host, Anthony Sweat, and this is Why Religion. Each year, religion professors at Brigham Young University produce hundreds of publications on subjects related to The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. This podcast brings this research into one place to enlighten the everyday seeker of truth. Seek learning, even by study and also by faith. Interviewing the author, we discuss why the study was done, why it matters, and why the professor chooses to be both a scholar and a disciple. This is Why Religion, research to enlighten your mind. My colleague Brad Wilcox here in the Religion Department recently sat down with John Hilton III to talk with him about his study on the scriptural emphasis on the crucifixion. So let's listen in with Dr. Brad Wilcox interviewing Dr. John Hilton about this subject. This line of research has just fascinated me. I have gotten so excited about it since I first heard about it. I'd like you to tell us a little bit about why you started focusing on this topic. So it began actually with looking at some of my own thoughts and feelings about the crucifixion, like many members of the church, I've tended in my life to focus on Gethsemane. And maybe if I saw the image of a cross, I'd kind of think, oh, that's, that's, that's not me. That's, that's not what, what I do. Well, I remember going to a youth conference where I was speaking, and it was at a Christian camp in the Northwest. And the leaders, the Latter-day Saint leaders, actually covered the cross that was there because they had rented the facility. And they said, we don't want this image here during our conference. I, I thought, wow, that's, that's kind of interesting that they would feel so strongly that they would want to cover that image. Yeah, that's definitely part of our culture, I think, among some people at least. And when I lived in Jerusalem for a year, I taught at BYU's Jerusalem Center. Obviously, there's lots of crosses everywhere all around Jerusalem. And I realized that there was some beauty that I had been missing by not carefully studying Christ's crucifixion. And I had a colleague say to me, why do church members tend to focus more on Gethsemane? And I thought, that's a great question. I was very curious. And so when I went and looked at the scriptures, I expected to find dozens and dozens of references about Gethsemane. But it turns out when it comes to references of scripture that specifically talk about Jesus Christ suffering for our sins in Gethsemane, there's only two references. Wow. And in contrast, there's more than 50 that talk about Jesus Christ dying for our sins. Now, are you talking just about biblical references? No, that's that's the thing. I, I said that to someone, they're like, well, thank heavens we have the restoration scripture. But for example, the Book of Mormon has one passage that's clearly about Gethsemane, but 18 that specifically say something like, Jesus Christ was slain for the sins of the world. Or when Jesus Christ in 3 Nephi 27 is defining his gospel, right up front in his definition, he says, my father sent me that I might be lifted up upon the cross. I mean, the crucifixion theology is very clear in the Book of Mormon, and it's the same in the Doctrine and Covenants. Multiple times in the Doctrine and Covenants, Jesus Christ will introduce himself saying, behold, I am Jesus who was crucified for the sins of the world. 
or make similar references. So I started being very curious. Well, wow, the scriptures have this. And and I think Elder Lund called it a doctrinal error to say that in Gethsemane, Jesus Christ overcame spiritual death and on the cross, he overcame physical death. But I think that's what a lot of people maybe have in their minds or think about. And the scriptures are very clear. No, on the cross, Jesus died for our sins. The cross didn't just overcome physical death. There was a component with overcoming our sins there as well. So I thought maybe Joseph Smith. We look at the teachings of Joseph Smith and in his non-canonized statements, Joseph Smith never refers to Gethsemane. But in contrast, he refers to the crucifixion 30 times. And several of those times, it's very specific about Jesus was crucified for the sins of the world. And then when you start to look at Brigham Young, John Taylor, Lorenzo Snow, that same pattern is there. What I did was I looked at journal of discourses and general conference talks from about 1850 to the present. And roughly for every one statement in general conference where you have a church leader saying something like, Jesus Christ suffered for our sins in Gethsemane, you have five statements saying Jesus Christ died for our sins on the cross. He is our mediator with the Father. He it was who died on the cross to atone for our sins. So there's a clear emphasis in our scriptures and from our church leaders on the atoning efficacy of the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. I read from Terrell and Fiona Givens lately in their book called The Christ Who Heals. They wrote about how it had to happen in both places because in Gethsemane, it was a private suffering, whereas on the cross, it was witnessed. It was a public suffering. They also talked about how in Gethsemane, there was suffering that in which Jesus was helped by an angel, by the Spirit, by God. But on the cross, he was left alone to truly descend below all things. So I think for me, it seems very obvious that both locations are important and that we're not having a tug of war between the two or a popularity contest. But how do most church members uh, view that? Do most of them accept that, that it happened in both locations? Or are church members a little hesitant to accept the suffering on the cross? And you're right. We're not trying to create a comparison or a competition between Gethsemane and Calvary. I think it is interesting to note, though, that there is a tendency for at least many church members to focus on Gethsemane. Let me just tell you a a couple of different surveys. So I've surveyed several hundred people, most of them students at Brigham Young University, although some from other populations. And when asked, where did Christ atone for our sins? More than 60% will write Gethsemane only. So when they're thinking, where did Christ atone for our sins? They're not thinking about the cross. In one version, I asked the question, where would you say the atonement mostly took place? And students had to select between Calvary and Gethsemane. And 88% of students said in the Garden of Gethsemane, and 12% said on the cross. And then a colleague suggested, well, maybe you should change that question so that they can select both Calvary and Gethsemane. So I recently asked about 100 adults, Although Christ's atonement was a process, where would you say Jesus mostly atoned for our sins? And the choices were on the cross at Calvary, in the Garden of Gethsemane, or Christ atoned for our sins equally in Gethsemane and on the cross. And I was surprised that 58% of people selected Gethsemane only. The second most popular was 40% talked about Christ atoning for our sins equally in Gethsemane on the cross. So obviously there's this 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 tradition in our culture it, is that tradition founded on anything besides just tradition uh, well it's certainly not founded on the hymn book for example the hymn book is very clear uh, the 1835 hymn book makes 30 references to Christ's death none to Gethsemane and wow. even our current hymn book also heavily emphasizes the crucifixion I think that there probably are, I mean, so I think the question is why the disconnect? I think maybe three possibilities are, there are some statements from church leaders, these are many years old, 
but that explicitly put down the cross. And I think some of those found their way into church curriculum and into the consciousness of some Latter-day Saints. Uh, and, and maybe connect with that, some very powerful statements have been written about Gethsemane. For example, in his book, Jesus the Christ, Elder Talmadge talks about the importance of both Gethsemane and Calvary, but his language in Gethsemane is maybe a little bit more vivid and powerful. And considering mainstream Christian tradition, there might have been a need for that, because I think there are many Christians who don't value Gethsemane as part of the atonement. Many Christians might look only at the cross. And so perhaps to try to counterbalance that, Elder Talmadge and others may have emphasized Gethsemane as, a, as an importance, uh, as, a, as a place of importance in the atonement, maybe to try to counterbalance that thought. You know, I think that's a, a really interesting idea. I think there's a natural tendency in many areas of life, not just religion, to focus on our differences. And the reality is, as Latter-day Saints, we have unique knowledge about Gethsemane that most Christians don't have. We know from the Book of Mormon and from the Doctrine and Covenants that Jesus Christ did suffer for our sins in Gethsemane. And so that does make the Gethsemane experience even more powerful. And so maybe I would wonder, though, if today we have the same need to focus on differences than we did back then. If I could share, th- this is on a, a different topic. Elder Holland in, the, in context was talking about the Trinity. Quote, I think I'm safe in saying that part of the reason we are so misunderstood by others in the Christian tradition is because in stressing the individual personages of the Godhead, we have not followed that up often enough by both conceding and insisting upon their unity in virtually every other way. For this, we have reaped needless criticism, and we have made our LDS position harder to be understood than it needs to be." End quote. And I wonder if it's been the same thing with Gethsemane and the cross. Maybe sometimes we have stressed so much Gethsemane without also saying, and we do believe in the atoning efficacy of the crucifixion, that we've made our position as a church harder than it needs to be. We've kind of hurt ourselves, maybe in some ways. Well, and sometimes by talking derogatorily about the cross, um, you know, we've often heard missionaries say, if if Jesus had been killed with a gun, would you wear a gun around your neck? Or we've heard young people say, Oh, the cross is a symbol of his death, and we believe in a living Christ. And I think perhaps as they're saying these things, like you say, they're they're emphasizing a difference rather than emphasizing the fact that we believe that the cross was very much a part of the atonement and that it is part of our doctrine, that it is the Holy Cross that we honor and that we love, and that we don't have to uh, separate ourselves in this in this area. And I think maybe one related um, little anecdote regarding that has to do with the fact that the cross has not always been viewed as a negative symbol within our church. For example, there was a proposal to put a cross on Ensign Peak that had the approval of the First Presidency in the early 1900s, and that wound up not happening. But the fact that it was approved shows that the way that sometimes we think about or talk about the cross today is not the way that our church always has. And certainly, if we were to go to any of the hundreds of millions of Christians that focus on the crucifixion of Jesus Christ and said, wow, why are you wearing that cross? Do you, do you believe in the dead Christ? They'd say, well, what are you talking about? Of course I believe in the living Christ. And for them, it's a beautiful manifestation of their faith. And I think it can be for all of us. And you mentioned earlier this idea of a private suffering in Gethsemane and a public suffering on the cross. And I've heard some people say, well, maybe we don't talk a lot about Gethsemane because we don't know a lot about it, because it was a private event, but really it was the most important thing. And and again, without trying to make a comparison between Gethsemane and the cross, there is one person who was in both locations and knows a lot about both events, and that's the Savior himself. And there's 11 different occasions after his resurrection in which Jesus Christ talks about the cruci- or either the crucifixion or Gethsemane. And on one of those occasions, he talks about Gethsemane. And on 10 occasions, he talks about his crucifixion. Are you talking about the Doctrine and Covenants? It, well, first of all, in the Book of Mormon, when he first appears to the people in the New World, he says, I have been slain for the sins of the world. 
Later, he says to the Nephite disciples, my father sent me that I might be lifted up upon the cross. But you're right, in the Doctrine and Covenants, on numerous occasions, he'll say something like, this is section 53, I, the Lord, was crucified for the sins of the world. So I do think it's important and helpful for us as Latter-day Saints to know that Jesus Christ himself personally has repeatedly witnessed about the importance of his crucifixion. And even if for some of us it seems like new territory, maybe we should learn more about it, if for no other reason than because it is so important to him. Beautiful. If you are interested in Latter-day Saint doctrinal and historical research such as this study, a great place to visit is BYU's Religious Studies Center at rsc.byu.edu. The Religious Studies Center provides excellent peer-reviewed gospel scholarship of both an academic and devotional nature to benefit a broader audience such as yourself in learning, teaching, and applying the restored gospel. I want to highlight one recent publication from the Religious Studies Center, The Rise of the Latter-day Saints, The Journals and Histories of Newell Knight, edited by Michael Hubbard McKay and William G. Hartley. Newell Knight, he was one of the very earliest Latter-day Saint converts and maintained a lifelong friendship with Joseph Smith Jr. The Journals of Newell Knight are part of a handful of essential early manuscript sources to understand the church's beginning history. Knight's history has always been a difficult source to use because it was never published in one volume until now. This book, The Rise of the Latter-day Saints, brings together Newell's various accounts into one published location. Take a look and pick it up at rsc.byu.edu. We've been listening to Professor Brad Wilcox interview Professor John Hilton III about teaching the scriptural emphasis on the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, published in the 2019 Religious Educator. For this part of Why Religion, we want to get into why does this study matter? What does it mean to us? How does it affect our lives as Latter-day Saints in learning, living, and applying the gospel? Well, here again is Brad Wilcox interviewing John Hilton III about that question. How does this research that you've done affect the lives of Latter-day Saints who are listening? I believe that what the standard works say matters. So what the scriptures emphasize and teach, I think we should emphasize and teach. And the fact that they heavily focus on the atoning efficacy of the crucifixion suggests to me that that's something that we should do as well. Maybe more importantly, this is similar to what we were just talking about, has to do with opportunities of building bridges with other people. I have a friend who was a taught missionary preparation course, and he would do role play activities. And his students who were pretending to be missionaries would knock on his door and say, oh, hi, we're the missionaries, and we'd like to talk to you about the atonement of Jesus Christ. And he'd say, oh, great, come on in. I saw that movie about Jesus on the cross dying for our sins. I loved it. And he said that about half the missionaries would stop and say, oh, no, 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 Jesus didn't die for our sins on the cross. He, he died or he suffered for our sins in Gethsemane. And so not only is that a doctrinal misunderstanding, it's also just poor practice of building on common beliefs. I think if I were a missionary today and saw someone wearing a cross necklace or a cross in their house, I would say, I see you believe in the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. Can I show you something from this book and turn to 1 Nephi chapter 11 when Jesus is slain for the sins of the world on the cross, and Nephi sees that in vision. I'd say, look, here's a prophet in America seeing this. There's so many things that we could just build. And uh, maybe one more anecdote on this. So I, I was sharing this with, uh, with a friend of a different faith. Well, she joined the church when she was 18. She had been Lutheran before. And she, afterwards, she wrote me this little note. She said, when I was introduced to the church, I learned about the suffering Christ experienced in Gethsemane, which greatly added to my understanding and appreciation of the Atonement of Jesus Christ. I moved to Utah to attend BYU one week after being baptized. I had studied, taken lessons, and contemplated my baptism for a year, so I think I had a decent understanding and foundation for being a new convert. I regularly wore a necklace with a small cross pendant that my grandmother had given me. On campus, I had a few experiences where students would start talking to me really nicely, and I realized they thought I wasn't a member partly because of my necklace. One of my friends even asked me to stop wearing the necklace. And then this is the part that really gets me. She said, I know that the Savior suffered on the cross. I have hesitated to share my thoughts and experiences about this, always wondering if my testimony of the atonement was not enough 
because I had a different balance between Gethsemane and his crucifixion. And I just think how sad that she's always wondering, is my testimony enough? Because she believes that the crucifixion of Jesus Christ is important. I think there's just opportunities, not just with other faiths, but even within our own faith community to be a little more open and loving and accepting. And and actually, frankly, there's never been a time that I've been able to uncover where a church leader has specifically forbidden wearing or displaying the cross. There's been a couple of occasions where it's been discouraged or a reason for not doing it has been given. But frankly, there's been a lot more statements from general authorities discouraging drinking caffeinated cola than wearing or displaying a cross. And there are some things that are cultural. And I think it's okay to find the differences between what's cultural and what's actually part of our doctrine. I think you're right. And I think that it's important that we clarify that as we're having this interview, we're certainly not saying, hey, we want a cross on the top of every Latter-day Saint chapel. And we're certainly not saying, oh, we think that everybody in the church should should now wear a crucifix. Although it's interesting that our Latter-day Saint chaplains in the military do wear a crucifix. They do wear a cross on their uniforms because they're chaplains. And I think that's very fascinating. But I just think that we don't have to go to that extreme to be able to have this research become meaningful to us as we realize that when a convert is wearing a cross, we don't have to run up to the person and say, no, 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 you don't do that anymore. Shame on you. I just think that we need to be a little more open and a little more understanding uh, and we need to not feel a, uh, not, not distance ourselves from it. When we see a cross on display on the back of someone's car or as we pass a Christian church, instead of having a negative response, let's smile and let's point and indicate to our children that's part of our doctrine too. And that's an important part of our beliefs as well. Just a couple of the terms that you've been using right now, crucifix and cross. Sometimes people use those terms interchangeably, and actually there's there's a subtle difference between them. I think having served a mission in a Catholic, predominantly Catholic country, I think I find myself leaning toward crucifix, and I probably do use those interchangeably. So clarify for us, what is the difference? So a crucifix would be the image of Jesus on the cross, and that is very common. So often in Catholic buildings, you would see a crucifix, the image of the cross with Jesus on the cross, whereas many Protestants would have an image of the cross without Jesus on it. So when people say, Oh, a crucifix focuses on the dead Christ. In some ways, you could see that because there is Jesus Christ on the cross. But on an empty cross, I think a Protestant would say, no, this focuses, this cross focuses on the living Christ. See, Jesus isn't on it. He's resurrected. But both focus on the suffering that Christ did for us on the cross. And in and in that regard, both are focused on the same thing that we believe, that Christ suffered for us and died for us on the cross. Absolutely. So I I have talked to many, many people who exactly what you said happened. They wore a cross to church, either as an investigator or at their first or second Sunday, and they were told, hey, don't do that. And these are the people who are still around. But it makes me wonder how many people aren't around who dropped out after being scolded for wearing a treasured artifact from their grandmother or great grandmother and said, Oh, this, I guess this church isn't for me. Uh, Brad, earlier you talked about this idea of the phrase of, well, we worship the living Christ. And that's certainly true. We definitely worship the living Christ. And I think for some people, that's almost a barrier. They see a picture of the crucifixion and say, Oh, I don't don't want any part of that. Recently, Anthony Sweat and I surveyed several hundred people and we showed them six images, three of the crucifixion, three of Gethsemane, And we said, if you had to choose one of these pictures to hang in your home, which would you choose? And 97% of Latter-day Saints 
chose an image of Gethsemane. So both have to do with suffering. Right. It's not like there's an image of the resurrection right. versus these images. Both images deal with suffering, but they were choosing to display Gethsemane. And when asked why, there were a, a, a very common statement was, I don't like to think about the death of Jesus Christ. And so I think it's helpful for maybe, yes, we worship the living Christ, and let's also remember that we worship a loving Christ. And how does Jesus Christ manifest his love for us? He said, greater love hath no man than this, than that a man lay down his life for his friends. So I think if I can see an image of the cross or the crucifixion and think of the loving Christ. In fact, that same theme is in the Book of Mormon. Nephi says, Christ loveth the world, even that he layeth down his own life, that he might draw all men unto him. It's an act of love on the cross. Not an act, I mean, it, clearly there is suffering there, but I think I can see it in a different way. Even at the end of the Book of Mormon, Moroni says to the Savior, thou hast loved the world even unto the laying down of thy life for the world. And, and just one more, because I think the cross is not only a manifestation of the love of Jesus, but also the love of a heavenly father. God, Paul says, commended his love towards us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And so for me, I think the frame of a loving Christ has really been helpful in reminding me that a picture of the crucifixion is, does not need to be viewed as a gory or discouraging thing. In fact, actually, it can be a beautiful thing, an image of love. I went to Normandy, the beaches of Normandy, the, the invasion of D-Day, and I will never forget how moved I was seeing an entire cemetery full of crosses. It just moved me to my very core. And it was that the crosses represented these men who had sacrificed their lives for my freedom. But the cross also reminded me of a Christ who sacrificed himself for all of us. And that was a moving moment in my life that involved the cross. So I'm grateful, John, for the research you're doing, and I hope it does help us to be able to understand a little bit more about the vital balance that has to be maintained between the suffering in Gethsemane and the suffering on the cross. And I think we need both of those in our minds. If you want to read the entire article by John Hilton III, Teaching the Scriptural Emphasis on the Crucifixion of Jesus Christ, published in The Religious Educator, Volume 20 of 2019, visit rsc.byu.edu forward slash whyreligion, and you can find a link to download the article. For this last part of Why Religion, we like to talk with the professor who published the study about why they believe, why they embrace religion, what it means to them, and why it matters. So as we wrap up this episode, here's Professor Brad Wilcox talking again with Professor John Hilton III about why he believes, why he chose to be a religious educator, and why the restored gospel matters to him. Since our podcast is called Why Religion, let's ask some why questions. Why did you choose to come to BYU? Why did you become a professor of religious education here? That's a great question. For about the first 10 years of my career, I taught seminary and institute and did a variety of things with religious education. And while I was getting my PhD, I taught part-time. Did you get your PhD? At Brigham Young University were you being in Florida? When were you there? I got my master's degree and then transferred to Florida to be the institute director in Miami for four years. And then I came to Provo to start my PhD. And during that time, I taught a few religion classes and just loved it. There was something exhilarating about being able to teach religion, both building faith, but also with us having some intellectual rigor. And I loved being a part of that environment. Well, I know that you got your master's at Harvard. So between Harvard and BYU, I think you definitely know about intellectual rigor. Uh, and I want our listeners to know that just recently you were named the, the young scholar 
uh, the the outstanding young scholar of all of BYU, of the entire faculty. And I thought that was a wonderful honor. Oh, thank you. I, w- I was definitely honored. One last question, John. Why do you believe in a world where so many who are intellectuals, so many who are scholars, choose not to believe? Why do you believe? I think throughout my life, I've just found such deep, abiding hope and peace through the teachings of the gospel of Jesus Christ. For me, some of those most profound ones have been from seriously studying the Book of Mormon. I remember as a freshman in college, one of my friends pointed to me to a a passage from President Benson where he said, there's a power that will flow into your life the moment you begin a serious study of the Book of Mormon. And I've really felt that power in my life as I've seriously studied the Book of Mormon, as I've seriously studied the Bible and the Doctrine and Covenants and looked at the teachings of Jesus Christ holistically, I feel the Holy Ghost and this is where I want to be. Thank you for listening to Why Religion. This podcast is a production of religious education at Brigham Young University in Provo, Utah. My name is Anthony Sweat. I'm the executive producer. The Why Religion podcast team also includes from Brigham Young University, professors Brad Wilcox, Casey Griffiths, and Ryan Sharp. Recording and mixing were done by BYU students Mitchell Bashford and Connor Miller. Say hi, Mitchell and Connor. Hey, guys. Hi. Original music and scoring for Why Religion podcast was created by the fabulous BOU student musicians Grant Cagle, Sam Clausen, Colette Jones, and Alistair Scheuermann. If you enjoy what you've heard, please like and subscribe to Why Religion on wherever you get your podcasts and leave us a rating. It really helps. And join us next time as we continue to bring the everyday Latter-day Saint fascinating gospel studies done by Brigham Young University religion professors to enlighten your mind and strengthen your faith.